Uh, <coughs> good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, a couple of adverts. If anybody wants circuit diagrams for um, everything, uh, if you want to send me a two terabyte hard drive, I'll copy whatever I've got here, which is, at the moment, uh, 544,000 circuit diagrams of radio, television, amplifiers, valves, um, what are those, the little things they had up there before the Peter Schweigel was going to look after? Transistors. Um, not going to cost you anything. It'll just be a couple of days for me to uh, copy it off the uh, this thing here and um, post it back to you. Um, obviously, an SAE would uh, go down very well. I have done it before. Um, it's a project um, probably for the HRSA more so than anything else. Also. Um, I've got this fetish about, uh, well, all my fetishes. Uh, I collect torches, circuit diagrams, radio valves. Uh, not, so many, not so many radios because I only live in a small um, place, so there we go. Um, anyway, um, first of all, I'll go across to... Um, oh, by the way, my history in radio, I did an apprenticeship in the... Uh, latter half of the 60s, um, then worked in the field for a company called ART Services, and I was the R&T fella. The um, appliance part used to be Hoover, but then Hoover took it over and we moved out uh, down to Camberwell as Pullen Electronics, which is now closed, and unfortunately for Alan, he died a few years back. Um, I then went to RMIT and taught TV, uh, video recorders, cameras, hi-fi for 28 odd years and uh, it's amazing I still get the odd student ringing me up saying uh, can you get a circuit for a whatever and uh, do you know what's wrong with it and it's uh, quite good to uh, be remembered to tell the truth so there we are. Um, that's the basis of a uh, coupling network and in general, that's a, a 0 0.01 capacitor, or if you want, 10 nanofarad. And that's normally about one meg. But what you probably don't know about it is, what's its frequency response like? Well, it's very, very simple to calculate it. If you do a sweep of frequencies in, have a look at the output, you will get an output that will, um, DC, it will be zero, then it will come up and it'll stay up there. Now you've got to bear in mind that the frequency along there is logarithmic because you've got uh, 10 cycles, 100 cycles, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, etc. Whereas up here, this is the amplitude and if you do it properly, uh, it's in decibels. Now what the simplest way to do it is you look at the largest level there and the coming down here it's so many dB down on the uh, largest level or you can um, pick it uh, 20 log uh, input voltage over output voltage if you want. Um, now of consequence I can't draw, I haven't done this for 20 years FO the cutoff frequency By the way, back in the old days, I used to write downhill as well. Um, yeah, so it's pretty simple. The cutoff frequency, which is where the voltage drops 0 0.707 of a volt, that is known, which is round about there, that is known as the um, half voltage point, uh, sorry, the 0 0.7 voltage point, or the half power point because 0.7 volts times 0.7 current equals 0.5 power. So that's why it's called the half power point. It's not a, a double GPO with uh, a machete put through it. So it's pretty simple. Uh, FO is calculable. Take the reciprocal of 6.28 times the value of R, which might be one meg, 
and the C is, say, a 0.1 capacitor. So really, really simple to uh, work out. Similarly, did you bring a duster? Um, New, newfangled duster. Look at that, will you? Jeez, high tech stuff. Similarly, if we want to make a, to a tone control, this is a uh, filter that will pass DC, won't attenuate it at all, but it will, the capacitive reactant of this device here, the capacitor, um, will decrease, oh, sorry, will increase, uh, will decrease impedance, or reactance I should say, with frequency. As frequency goes up, its reactance goes down. So hence we're going to have a frequency response passes DC, it'll drop off. And again, seeing this as a log in decibels, um, again, you will find that there will be a uh, point where the voltage drops 0.7, and that will be your half power point. So your frequency is quite readable if you want to do a sweep of it and record take recordings, or you can calculate it using the same formula. It's the best formula of all time. It also applies to inductor, except it's RL on the top line. But because you can't really buy inductors like you can buy capacitors, um, most tone controls are um, um, RC type ones. So this one here, this is a, a treble a base and a mid-range tone control network and I can change the um, setting of the pot as you can see there. Now the, uh, compared to the input signal, the output signal here has a loss of around about 10 dB and that's fairly common for most uh, base treble tone controls. The only thing is that the more RC seconds you stick in here, the less linear will be your frequency response. And as you can see here, this is just to adjust all the pots to get it as flat as possible. We're still looking at uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dB of um, frequency distortion across the bandpass for that particular type. Now, that one is, oh, these are all for guitar amps and they're done by a bloke whose name escapes me at the moment. And that was for a Marshall uh, triple tone control. This one here is for a Fender. Again, a triple tone control. The, the circuit configuration, just to go back again, you can see is substantially the same, but the values have changed a little bit. And you can see here that um, this one has got more, uh, more attenuation and uh, again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine dB of um, non-linearity. To go to a Vox one, which is more so what we use here, um, to use a two section one, to get it as flat as possible. There you go, we're probably looking about a 10 dB of variation across the uh, band pass. Go further, you'll notice that they've got an isolation resistor in here with two tone controls, jack up the bass a little bit and jack up the treble a, a little bit. And with this particular one with the isolation resistor in there, we've got about, uh, it's flat within about one or two dB. So that's 
really quite acceptable. And that's the one that um, most hi-fis, including the uh, Mullard 1010 up there that uh, nobody needs to look at at all, um, uses. Now, if you want to analyse how does this tone control work, well, what you do is you put the pot, say the uh, base pot, put it down the bottom, so the, oh, so the wiper, where's my red pointer? So that wiper there, that wiper there is down the bottom, and really it comes back to a tone control network with a series resistor and shunt capacitor. Uh, the series resistor is that one there, and the shunt cap is uh, that one there. So if you want to analyze it, you can bring it back to almost two components. Similarly, if we go to the uh, top, of the tone control for the base. The uh, wiper is up the top, so you've got a 100K resistor and a shunt capacitor down there to uh, jack up the base. And as you can see, it makes a uh, quite a difference. Similarly, with the treble control, um, same sort of thing occurs, except uh, we swap over the RC components. And if you want to find a cutoff frequency, well, you can look at it here, look at the uh, 3 dB down point, which is 1, 2, 3 dB, come across, and the 3 dB or the half power point for the base frequency is about oh, 120, 130 hertz. So you come down to the bottom line about there. So if that's 100, that's 200, uh, 3, 4, 5, etc. So it's calculable using that, that simple formula there. Just to finish off another couple, there's another uh, different configuration of tone control, but it's the base one only. And finally, using inductors. Now, we're going to run into a few resonance problems here, I would tend to think. But still, it's within a couple of dB as far as um, flatness is concerned. And because we've introduced, uh, we've got one, two, three, four reactive components, we can uh, achieve a much flatter response. But if you want to look at the, where the pots are, they're not... If, if there were um, concentric pots, they're not um, at the naught point. They're around there for a flat response. Uh, and this is fairly important, especially um, if you're using uh, logarithmic pots, you don't... Oh, look at that, it does work. Okay, this is a uh, complementary symmetry amplifier. It's only out of a small uh, five transistor radio, one, two, three, four, five. Its performance is really quite remarkable. It's equal to a uh, six transistor radio, yet we've got a mixer oscillator, autodyne, followed by an IF amplifier, a diode feeding back AGC voltage. When the AGC from the diode comes back and affects the uh, base of the IF transistor. And for the output, we've got two emitter followers, and that's the uh, basis of any complementary symmetry amplifier. In this particular one, they're AWA transistors, little AS128, uh, which is probably similar to a uh, BC107 and similar to a, uh, uh, what's it, a BC547. I can't, uh, one, I can't remember what the earlier one is now. Now, all they are is emitter followers and they're driving a loudspeaker. In this particular case here, it's 47 ohms. Um, you can drop the impedance of the loudspeaker if you want to make it, uh, whack an 8 ohm one in there, because after all, an earpiece is 8 ohms. It will still work. Uh, what will happen is that the power output will increase. Uh, it will draw more current it's possible that the output transistors will get warmer than what they should, but because they're um, silicon transistors, 
uh, it's unlikely that you'll end up with thermal runaway because it's got a bias diode in there which will also heat up at the same rate as the transistors. They're normally mounted fairly close together. And once one starts um, heating up, the voltage between there and there will decrease, hence the output transistors will draw less current and run a bit cooler. Now, uh, talking about running a lower impedance speaker, the advantage is that you'll get more power out. You've still got the same nine volt operating voltage, uh, and that'll drop about a volt, that'll drop about a volt. So you've got about seven volts peak to peak across the loudspeaker. If you want to work out Ohm's law, uh, with a 47 ohm, it's too hard for me, but with an eight ohm speaker, that's nearly a watt of power output you're gonna get. 47 ohms, um, probably gonna be about a quarter watt. So quite substantially less. However, there's always a however, the distortion does increase. The higher the impedance of the load, the less will be the distortion on the output. And I'm talking about amplitude distortion. Instead of having a nice round sine wave, it will tend to be clipped or flattened on the top. And that will increase distortion quite markedly. Now, this emitter follower here, to turn it on, you pull the base downwards, and that's done by this transistor here. It's in inverter stage, uh, no thermal bias, probably doesn't really need it because it's a uh, silicon transistor. Um, and it gets its bias from uh, that resistive network there. And signal is fed in from the tap on the volume control uh, via a coupling capacitor to the base of the transistor. Now, what turns this transistor on is this resistor at the top here. And what allows it to be turned on is this one here turning off. So as this one turns off, then um, the current for the base of the transistor will, will be supplied through this resistor here, but only um, when the phone jack is complete and uh, the speaker is in circuit. And the idea is that uh, uh, if you have an open circuit speaker, then uh, there's no current in the upper stage full stop. And that's why they uh, run it uh, like that. Now there's another one I've got here too, which I didn't, didn't keep. Oh, books. I came across this the other day, and if anybody wants it, they're very welcome. I can email it to you. I think I can. I'll just go out of that for a bit. Uh, 12 meg, yes, I can just do it. It's a book by Tektronics, and it tells you the steps to check an amplifier. All of those are all listed there. So rather than have to listen to me tell you, you can, uh, em I can email you the book. Fairly simple email address, rhtv at telstra.com, if you can remember that, and I'll email it back to you. Okay. Now, I designed an amplifier going back, to tell the truth, it was 10 years back now, and it's still a project. Um, I shifted house um, probably about six or seven years ago and haven't touched it since, but I did all the calculations. It's a uh, stereo amp on a fairly big chassis, about yo long, yo deep, yo deep, four KT66s, uh, which was uh, my preferred valve back in those days, mainly because I had some GEC ones. I got uh, five of them, one spare. and. Um, 20 watts, as far as I'm concerned, is enough. Now, I've also got two output transistors, which I think from memory is about 8K plate to plate. And when you, it's the same as a, um, a leak TL12 amp or any of the um, mono blocks you see floating around. Uh, they're all pretty well the same with KT66s. They all have, uh, they're all push-pull and they all have 
um, push pull output transformer, same sort of impedance. They all run on about, I've only drawn one channel as well. So when this uh, point here drops to zero because the grid has gone towards zero volts, it turns hard on. That means the 400 volts at the centre tap there and naught volts there will be transformed. Can I say it? Will be transformer inverted to 400 volts on the other side. Instead, instead of this one at the bottom being naught, that will be positive. In other words, the output transformer will have 800 volts peak to peak across it. Absolutely amazing, but unless you actually put one on a crow and have a look, uh, that is the way that it is. Um, modern output stages uh, are usually 8 ohm speakers, but some high power speakers are uh, 4 ohms. And again, if you put a 4 ohm speaker on the 8 ohm, uh, it will still work okay. We'll give you more output, but the distortion level will increase. How much? It's by a measurable amount. You won't be able to hear it, but it will increase. So the specifications for, oh, it's too hard to find. Won't worry about it at the state. We'll go from about, uh, say, 0.03% uh, to maybe 0.04, 0.05%. So it will increase, but uh, really a negligible amount. Now, whilst these amplifiers give you pretty good distortion figures, and I'm talking about clipping on the top of the waveform, um, compared to a transistor amplifier of uh, modern design, such as the ones we have in, such as the ones we have in silicon chip, I've got to remember to talk to the side, um, they're pretty high in distortion. Uh, there's one in silicon chip which is really quite amazing. Uh, it was immeasurable. How do you measure distortion? I bought one here to show you. I bought this about 12 months ago from um, uh, Ray Kelly, actually. Uh, never used it. It uses batteries in it. That means I've got to go up the street and buy batteries. Um, but I don't think on one of those transistor amps produced by silicon chip, of which now you can't get all the transistors for anyway, you'd have to use substitutes. I don't think it would measure the degree of distortion that those amplifiers would give out. Now, for a um, noise and distortion meter, firstly, you need a very, 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 very low distortion oscillator, usually of the wind bridge type, wind bridge, whatever you want to call it, where it has a series R, a balanced one. Now, the one we've got up there is an unbalanced circuit. Uh, sorry, that's not quite balanced yet, but it is symmetrical. To make it, to make it balanced, That is a balanced circuit. Funnily enough, still applies. Okay. So they use those balanced circuits in the Weinbridge oscillator to generate a distortion-free signal. Then the other part of the um, distortion analyzer, it has a very, very high quality filter. And you tune it usually to 300 hertz. I don't know why, but it usually is 300 hertz. Uh, and you measure sorry, you, you remove the fundamental frequency and you measure what's left. Now, it can either be noise or it can be harmonics. And usually, an amplifier such as this will generate harmonics. So, um, that's how you measure your distortion. And, of course, it's on a, it read out on a calibrated meter. Uh, that... Meter, that distortion meter would probably be um, in the 50s, so it's uh, pretty old. And why did I buy it? Well, when I finished building this amplifier here, which is a home on my uh, workbench, 
I intend to test it, see what it's like. So there you go. Now, what causes this distortion mostly in amplifiers? It's usually in the output stage. If it was a class A amplifier, then the distortion would be minimal. It would be as low as you can get it. But the valves, uh, if it's a 20 watt amplifier, they would be dissipating an extra 10 watts each. In other words, if there's four of them in the amp, then it would be, um, you'd almost need a fan to keep the thing cool. Uh, as it is, uh, with 40, uh, 30 milliamps and 400 volts across each valve, that's a fair amount of power. Uh, after five minutes, you'd burn your hand if you uh, touched one. Okay, so it's mainly the quiescent current which is determined by uh, the bias between the control grid and the cathode. In each case, the control grid and cathode. Um, if that bias is too high, the, in other words, if the grid is too far negative with respect to the cathode, or the uh, bias across the resistors here is too high, or the resistors are too high in value, say they're, one's gone high to, or both gone high to say 1k ohm, the, the voltage will increase across the two of them, and rather than run it as a class AB amplifier, it will be running as a class B amplifier. In other words, it's going from cutoff to saturation, depending upon the uh, input signal at the control grid. Right, now I've configured this thing here um, to work as either a triode amplifier or a pentode amplifier. If it's a triode amplifier, I've just added a little switch in here, which connects the screen grid to the anode. Whereas if it's run in pentode, it's, it's run in ultralinear format, whereby the screen grids are run to 20% tap on the output transformer. I don't know where the terminology ultralinear came from, but uh, that's what they call it. Um, what it does, it provides a degree of negative feedback uh, to the valve itself. As soon as you drive the grid positive, the anode or the cathode will emit more current, the anode current will increase. The voltage, just to look at one valve at a time, the voltage at the anode will uh, decrease. So the screen voltage also decreases. So there'll be less voltage for the um, screen to operate from. Now that is in sympathy with uh, the anode voltage and that was caused by the uh, grid voltage. And so we end up with a uh, push-pull action. Now because we have this push-pull circuit, um, one of the things that does happen is that the even harmonic distortion is uh, phase-wise cancelled and that's, um, well, one of the desirable things you can uh, want. Now, uh, if you drive this grid positive, you need to drive this grid negative in sympathy, same signal, but opposite polarity, which means that we do need what we call a phase inverter. And this particular valve here, it's got two almost similar anode resistors and signal is fed to pin two of the first triode. And you'll notice that it's got a fairly high value um, cathode resistor. In fact, if you want to look at it in this way, um, 60K in parallel with 60K is roughly 30K and this one down here is roughly 30K as well. So this valve here, by virtue of its cathode circuitry, is driving the grid come cathode uh, of the second triode. Hence, uh, we will develop an antiphase signal between the two anodes. If I run a positive signal here, the anode of this one will go negative that will drive the anode of that one, sorry, the grid of that one negative. Um, 
As we drive this one positive, the cathode goes positive, um, dri uh, drives this one towards cutoff, and uh, this voltage here will increase. So that's how we achieve our phase splitter action. Now, the gain of this is pretty well only one because it's a an emitter follower circuit. The gain of this is well, maybe half a dozen for the output stage. So we need a voltage amplifier and um, I've picked a, an EF86 pentode valve. And by the way, this amplifier is almost a direct copy of a leak to TL12, which is uh, a very much sought after amplifier. I've changed a couple of components here because when I looked at the data book, uh, a 12AU7 or a 12AT7 is run to absolutely maximum um, of its specifications. So I picked a double triode 12BH7, which is from a uh, TV vertical oscillator, and it can easily take a uh, 400 volt supply. So that's why the change. I think from memory, the pin connections are the same, so it's easily substituted. I also have a couple of special class EF86s that I bought at, uh, in conjunction with somebody else at one of the other uh, HRSA auctions when it was down the road here at the church. Uh, and I will obviously use those. This in the middle here is a tone control circuit. Same thing applies, treble control, isolation resistor, uh, input to the top of the two networks. This one, this one here is a uh, CRC, whereas this one here is an RCRC network. Uh, followed by a balance control which heads off to the um, other um, channel, which is not shown here. I also incorporated a um, loudness control here which jacks up the treble. Um, being a very old person, I uh, like bass, and plus the fact I'm going deaf, it means I can't hear as well as I used to. In fact, nowhere near as um, well as I used to, and same with treble. My ears are unfortunately down to about uh, five kilohertz these days, as well as my right ear being about uh, 30 dB down. That's quite a substantial amount. And yes, I do have hearing aids, and no, I don't wear them. And uh, that's, that's a, a disease called senility, which uh, has got well and truly hold of me. Okay. Now, how do we get the loudness control to work and provide more treble? Well, what we do is we put a very, very small capacitor across between the top of the volume control and the wiper of the volume control. And that uh, value of the capacitor is, is nearly one nanofarad. And I did my calculations. I forgot what they were now. You can work it out. Uh, same, same formula. Uh, 680 puff and 668k. You can work out my uh, treble um, half power point frequency. For the bass, I've got a tap on the pot. And you try getting one of those these days and see how you go. Just not available. However, if you've got a tap pot, you don't know what to do with the resistor capacitor, which is the bass boost pair, put it to the wiper. It'll work almost equally as well. Now, what happens here is we've got a base boost series R and shunt C network. This, uh, this is only part of the series R. The other part is the top part of the pot. And um, again, if it's the pot's, say, one meg pot, then you've got, say, if it's halfway along, 470K and uh, 22 nanofarad, same formula. You can work out your uh, base uh, boost frequency. Okay, I also have provided a 47K for tape out. I'm not real sure why I've put that there because nobody uses a tape recorder. Although you've got to bear in mind that I, I designed this 10 years back, so uh, it was quite some time back. 
<clears throat> now, a, a tone control has, as we saw on the graphs before, around about 10, 12 odd dB insertion loss. And that is about a stage of gain. So to compensate for the tone control, just because I'm finicky and I want my bass boosted and treble boosted too, because I can't hear it anymore, I've got to put an extra um, amplifier stage in. Now, I've got a multi-switch and I use an ISO stat switch with push buttons like the old uh, test instruments you used to use. I actually do have one. Um, I do intend to change the design a little bit. I've yet to run the cabling from all the RCA sockets. I intend to make a little printed board with a bunch of relays on them and I'm going to put relays on here and connect them all up to all of these inputs so that I've only got to run one pair of coax cables because at the moment I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lots of coax cables times two, 16 coax have run from the back of the thing to the uh, switch at the front. I think it'd be a lot easier rather than have to terminate uh, 16 times two ends, 32 uh, cables with uh, braid and uh, insulation on the braid and so forth, I'll put relays up the uh, bottom end and uh, probably just run two for the normal AV level. And by the way, that they all should be the same AV level. You'll also notice that on a couple of the inputs here, I put uh, trim pots so that if one output is louder than the other, then I can adjust the trim pot to drop the um, volume level a little bit. But I've made them so that you can't drop it to zero because if I happen to be mucking around one day and I turn this pot down to the ground end, then I'm going to get no output and I'll be wondering what the heck has happened to the uh, uh, amplifier. Whereas if I stick a 10K in the bottom end of the pot, then it'll uh, drop to 90% of uh, volume. Okay, I've actually stuck a little bit of metering on it too. Um, oh, meters across the other side. I put a couple of uh, lamps on it too. One to monitor the filaments, one to monitor the B plus, and one also uh, to monitor the uh, voltage drop across the filter choke to make sure that the thing is drawing current. Also, in the broadcast industry, you can get little circles of spaghetti about oh, two or three millimetres long, and they've got one, two, three, four, five, etc., or ABC written on them. On the B plus lines uh, that we had before, say the 400 volts, I put 400V on it so that I know uh, which is the 400 volt line, just to be fancy because I can. And when you work at Channel 7 and you've got a drawer full of little um, numbers, why not? Okay, for metering on the outputs stage, I've just got, uh, they, Somebody at Channel 7 dropped a TIAC professional video recorder. Instead of being nice and square, it got skewed. Fortunately, the meters were all right, and I've got the meters out of them, and um, I've, uh, I'm picking up the audio from the upper transformer via a, a silicon diode, a capacitor, and I think that if I want the meters to move a bit slower, I'll have to increase that increase that capacitor from, from 10 microfarad, which I don't think will be enough to probably near a thousand microfarad so that the meter's not moving really fast, so I'll move slower. Um, because they're calibrated in dB, the power meters, um, I put a couple of pots in there so that um, compared to 20 watts, which will be zero output, I can um, have it uh, and read 3 dB down, 6 dB down, 10 dB down, etc. Okay, um, another one I've done, I've put a meter on the cathode of the output stages so that I can monitor the four cathode voltages. But uh, since I did this one here, I've changed that. 
you're able to buy yourself a little panel meter about three centimeters left to right and about one and a half centimeters high and there's a three digit uh, readout on it uh, with two volts maximum. So I'm going to replace that with four of these, I've already bought them, uh, and I'll be able to monitor the cathode current uh, digitally. So I'll be able to see if it's 30 milliamps, 40, and so forth. Um, when I used to service um, amplifiers, one of the things that people used to bring them in for was to uh, set up the quiescent current, because most of them didn't have um, cathode bias, like with fixed resistors in the cathode, but rather they had a, a minus 50 volt supply and these two resistors in the grid circuit were returned to a pot for valve top and a pot for valve bottom. And you would monitor the cathode current across, usually they stuck a 10 ohm resistor in there so you could monitor the cathode current and adjust it for uh, 10 milliamps, uh, sorry, for 30 milliamps. That was the most common uh, value. It didn't make any difference whether it was KT66 or KT88. The major difference with those two valves is that uh, out of a KT88, and I'll show it to you in just a moment, a KT88 will deliver pretty well three times the power that a KT66 will, and they do work quite well. Okay, the preamp. The preamp, um, can't say I designed it, but I, I was the one that stole it from a Luxman. Um, it uses a 12AX7 twin triode, uh, just a normal voltage amplifier, but it has negative feedback. And it has two sets of CR networks in the feedback loop and that's to give it the RIAA-shaped feedback loop. And in the preamp, it's opposite to the equalisation that was provided uh, before the LP record was made. Now, there are different ones of 78s, but, uh, well, who's got a, a noise-free 78 that they want to listen to with correct equalisation these days? Pretty well nobody, so, in fact, if I think about it, who's got a, a good LP that's not free from scratches? And plus the fact, um, my latest job for the last 10 odd years has been cleaning the music for Eastern FM radio station, and we're up to uh, just over half a million uh, songs on disc, all of pretty well, which have been cleaned. Uh, we also have a different category, which has got about 30, 40,000 songs of pre 1940s music, all of which is really quite listenable. And we've got a few people at the radio station that um, really like to play this pre-1940s music. So if you need any pre-1940s music, um, give the yell and a hard drive. Okay, um, for the pre-amplifier stage here, I decided to get really, really fancy uh, and also because I had a couple of voltage regulator gas tubes. Uh, a VR150, which funnily enough is 150 volt valve, and a VR109 is a, funnily enough, 109 volt valve. In series, that regulates at 259 volts, and that's the DC voltage that I have for B3. Uh, so instead of calling it uh, whatever it is there, um, I've called it uh, 240 volts, and that's the regulated supply for the preamp valves. I had a bit of room on the chassis, and I thought, oh, a bit of purple glow in the middle of the chassis will look good, so I've done it. So there we go. Okay, uh, that's the amplifier. Uh, I hope to finish it within the next uh, 10 years, been 10 so far. I've drawn all, uh, sketched all of this circuit diagram on a probably about an A2, A2 sheet of paper with all of the components where they all go. Um, I'm not going to cat it like I did this. This is version... It's about version 20 anyway. I've made a few, a few alterations over the years and still got a few to go. So there we go on that one. Now, this is directly lifted from the internet. 
and it's, it's an amplifier designed by the triad guy. And he's got, um, I've forgotten whether it's parallel push-pull um, KT88s, but uh, as you can see, it's a 60 watt amplifier. And its performance is quite good. Now, why haven't I gone to KT88s? Well, firstly, they're about $100 each. Four of them in each channel is $800 worth of valves. Now, whilst I could afford $800, I don't want to spend $800 just to get an extra 40 watts. And the Apple transformers, they'd probably cost another $800. And then the power transform would have to be humongous. I'd probably have to get my welder rewound to uh, supply power for the thing. So we haven't um, gone to um, a high power amplifier. Sorry, you got to speak up. I'm deaf, remember? I said you won't get enough out of the grid to power it. <laughs> Probably you're right too, yeah. Look, there's a lot of these um, amplifiers around. Uh, I might have a picture of one called a... It's got six KD88s in each um, output stage. And to ba balance them, you've got to leave the thing on for half an hour and you tweak all the pots, wait for another half hour, tweak all the pots to get the quiescent current all the same, and it does take a long time. If I run out of time, can you give me a yell? A friend of mine had a uh, high watt app, and I think that had about four or six KT88s in it. Yeah. A uh, musician, of course, but uh, it was too big. It was just, it's like picking up a like, box of bricks. Yeah. Like, power fans were I can remember one I got, which was an antique, that was the brand amplifier, it had half a dozen KD88s in it, and one was uh, crook, and you can see it's sort of glowing purple on the bottom, which meant it had a bit of gas in it, and the gettering, silvering had gone sort of purpley. So I got one valve in, uh, which was a uh, audio harmonics, I think it was from Russia, and put that in and it made actually a, a noticeable difference at the output stage, but the trouble is I couldn't balance the um, output current. This one valve was drawing uh, 100 milliamps and all the rest were drawing 10 milliamps and I couldn't get them up and I couldn't get this one down. So I had to quote the guy, um, oh, some ridiculous amount of money, at sort of 50 bucks a valve times, uh, what was it, eight for two amplifiers and uh, I can't remember whether he got the job. No, he didn't get the job done. But if you think about it, all those valves in a cupboard, because you wouldn't want the thing outside getting dusty, it would be, it'd be a kilowatt of heat, like having a, a single bar radiator in the cupboard. So uh, probably not a good idea to have a amplifier that's so high power. Oh, faults in amplifiers. Most amplifiers you get, or radios for that matter, matter, have scratchy volume controls. Now, I've mentioned this before. CRC or WD-40 or something that's even better is CAKE, C-A-I-G, F5, F5, fader lubricant. The trouble is that Yeah, well, I must admit, this is uh, fairly old. So there you go. But it, it does do a good job and it does last. Um, the other thing, that if it keeps recurring, you need to measure with a voltmeter on the, uh, on the wiper and also on the top of the volume control, make sure that there's no DC because sometimes valves will leak electrons out of the grid and put DC onto the uh, tap of the volume controls, and that has a propensity to make them scratchy. Similarly, if the coupling capacitor from uh, wherever it's coming from, the previous preamp stage, is a bit leaky and is putting positive volts on the top of the pot, that will make it scratchy, in which case all you need to do is replace the, um, uh, the capacitor. Or if it's in the wiper of the volume control, 
put another coupling capacitor and a shunt resistor in. The shunt resistor is the same value as the, uh, the pot, so if it's a one meg pot, use a one meg resistor, half meg pot, use a half meg resistor. The value of the coupling capacitor, use the one that uh, is on the input, so if it's a 0.1 microfarad on a hi-fi amp, use a 0.1 microfarad or 100 nanofarad if you're uh, so inclined. Going back down to the high power amplifier. Oh, that's the HMV one. By the way, this one works pretty well in the same way we had before, except, how do I reduce this on this computer? Too hard. Uh, instead of having a pull up resistor for the, uh, that top transistor there, and using the transistor here in the bottom, it's in the other configuration. So rather than have a, a PNP in the top, you, you could always put a PN, an NPN in the bottom and a resistor, fixed resistor up there. So what would be the impedance between collector and emitter in this transistor? Well, same as the 1.5K there. I mean, it takes 1.5K to turn this one on, Similarly, it takes 1.5K to turn this one off. And if the speaker goes open circuit, there's no DC path for the bottom transistor. Seeing the two outputs emitter followers are in series, no current in the output stage. So that's how they do tend to protect their um, output transistors. This, by the way, is the HMV mantle. Right, I'm just looking for that quad KT88 amplifier. Now that's mine. Oh, look, at that doesn't really matter, I think, at this stage. Um, I think uh, that will almost do it. Now, um, I've mentioned most faults are in the um, output stage followed by the uh, coupling capacitors in the output stage. They're the most common faults that will cause uh, problems um, in amplifiers. It can end up causing a power transformer to overheat. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, cause the uh, output transformer to short circuit, although for a short period of time it should take a short OK. And hopefully that line there is adequately fused, uh, like this one here is. Um, we've got uh, fuses somewhere. I can't remember where they are to tell the truth, but that's on version 21. The fuse will be on version 21. It could be too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've used uh, wire in uh, silicon fuses too. Oh, by the way, because of 5AS4, it producing 400 volts at the output, go away, um, is running at its maximum rating, or a 5A AR4 as well. I've stuck a couple of silicon diodes in there, 1N4, 008, 800 PIV diodes, so that um, the, the valves, when uh, each one is on, uh, uh, during turn off, it's not subjected to excessively high voltages. Now, um, one thing you uh, do need to do when you're checking amplifiers is to provide um, a, a safety test. So you, you cannot return an amplifier to a customer with the bottom plate removed where they can stick their fingers underneath it to pick it up and get dissolved with 400 volts DC because 400 volts DC will kill you quicker than what 200 volts, uh, 240 volts AC will. So you've got to do a, a visual inspection of the amplifier, make sure that nobody's going to get electrocuted by, um, it should pass what's called a standard finger test. You should be able to poke your finger all over whatever you're testing and it shouldn't be able to get electrocuted. Next one is the power cord. It's got to be in good condition. Next one is if it's not a double insulated appliance, then the chassis does need to be earthed. Now, um, depending upon 
uh, what you want. Um, most good amplifiers will have a double pole, double throw power switch, but personally, on a high power amplifier, I prefer to parallel both poles and just put it in one leg. Now, after you've repaired an amplifier, you really should give it a mega check. Now, a mega is a uh, ohmmeter, which will uh, provide a high voltage output, and typically 500 volt is the standard for megas. And um, you check it between the two mains wires connected together and the chassis. And the other thing you really need to do is with a low ohms meter, check the earth pin to the chassis as well. Now there is a specification, uh, ANZ 3760, uh, I can't remember, it's too long ago now. I used to do safety testing um, back in the old days. Too much hard work now. So uh, you, you really should check all your amplifiers with a mega, which brings us on to another one. Ah, there it is. How to make your own mega. Oop, I've got the wrong one up here. If you're doing repairs for anybody, you do need to check. Make sure that what you're doing is safe. Now, you can either use a, uh, a bought mega or you can make your own. It's pretty simple. The mega is pretty simple to use. At one meg or less resistance going to open circuit, uh, the appliance is regarded as being good. Personally, I think if I had two meg leakage, I'd find out why. If it's less than one meg or short circuit, then the thing is highly bloody dangerous and you need to check it. What I've got here, if I can find a circuit diagram, I've got two 40 volts AC going into a 10 volt transformer uh, and using a transformer backwards, a 12 volt to 240 volts. And running 10 volts into 12 volts gives you about 200 volts AC. That runs into a, uh, a voltage doubler and that produces 500 volts DC at the output. It then goes to a meter and the meter has in series with the 500 volts um, 250k ohms, which means that if you want to work it out, 500 volts, 250k, the current in the meter is 2 milliamps. 2 milliamps will give you quite a painful electric shock, but it won't kill you. It takes 100 milliamps to uh, kill you. 2 milliamps could give you a secondary injury, like you'd stick your hand in, get a belt, pull it out, and uh, uh, take the back of your hand off on a uh, sharp piece of steel that you may have in your workshop or wherever. So using a mega, you do need to be careful. I have a mega with a earth test probe hanging down. All I do is I plug the appliance into it and I put the test probe on earth and I look for hopefully zero scale deflection on the thing. If it's any more than about two mega, I will investigate why. The normal cause is the power transformer having moisture ingest ingestion. And the paper on, on the primary winding gets leaky to the frame of the transformer. How do you fix it? Leave it on for uh, 24 hours or so. Don't touch it, because you'll get a belt. And then, once it's fixed, you spray it, what with? Paint. Now, if you spray it with red paint, it's going to look bloody awful. If you spray it with black paint and you haven't pulled out of the chassis, well, every other thing in the chassis is going to get covered with uh, black paint as well. You could use purple, it doesn't really matter. But if you're, if you're concerned about how things look, use clear lacquer. Nobody can see it. But work it well into the uh, transformer winding, top and bottom. And uh, the other thing that's a very, very good idea is have a, a piece of wood with a power cord on it, two light globes and a power outlet on it. Two light globes in series with the uh, um, active and plug your appliance in it. Doesn't matter if it's an amplifier 
with two only 100 watt incandescent light globes, no good putting uh, CFLs or LED lamps in there. Um, but with a couple of incandescents, a mantle radio will work with a 60 watt globe in it quite well. And if you turn the, uh, on an amplifier, if you turn the volume up when, it, when the class AB output stage draws more current, you'll see the globes fluctuating in uh, redness. But in general, if the amplifier is okay, they will glow just to a level where you can see the redness in, in the amplifier itself. Okay, I think my uh, uh, professor is after me and um, I'll return the microphone to him. Oh, by the way, um, I taught uh, teachers in Indonesia um, how to repair both colour television and uh, video recorders. It was really a cultural shock for me because in the end I was counting down the days before I could come home again. And what I used to do after work, I would roam the streets into the, all of these markets that they had around, um, it was a place called Bandung, and if you're Indonesian you call it Bandung. Um, I used to have an absolute ball. Um, and I ended up bringing 70 kilograms in a big old pneumatic box home. And when I was at the airport, I didn't have enough money to pay for the freight because the box was 70 kilos. And uh, I put all the repair I had on the counter, which was about 70 Australian dollars. And I said to the guy, you put this package on the plane, you keep what you want and pay for freight for the rest. And he goes, okay. But I'm quite sure that parcel went on the plane and the uh, Qantas airline got absolutely no money. Anyway, I've still got those two isolation transformers and that's another thing too I forgot to mention. You really do need to use an isolation transformer whenever you are repairing anything. Make a point of plugging your repair into the isolation transformer. Not your crow, not your DVM, not your lead lamp, just one appliance only and that's the one you're working on. Because if you plug two appliances into a double GPO, it's no longer safe. So just a little clue for you. Anyway, thank you gentlemen and lady.